So it's, uh, so it's my birthday, but let me tell you, my life is like a grain of sand in comparison to Jesus. And we're here tonight not to lift me up, but to lift up Jesus. So I want to hear everybody say, Jesus! Jesus! All right, all right. Now, I know Brother Chris didn't know what I was going to speak on tonight, but uh, we're speaking on tonight. This, this is uh, my birthday, the last day of November. We're speaking on what we're thankful for. We're speaking on what, what goodness there is in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and our God. And I'm just so glad each one of you here. I hope that somehow or another you can just get a small grasp of how important you are to the Lord. Now just very briefly before I get into my message, in my own heart, I'm certainly thankful that I serve a God who hasn't given up on me. All the times I've messed up and all the times I've went wrong and all the times I thought I had it right and all the times I operated in the flesh, he never gave up on me. And when, when you think about all the things that, that God had to forgive you for and he still loves you, he still loves you enough to send his son Jesus Christ down here. I'm thankful that I serve a God whose love is everlasting. He don't just love me today. He loves me forever. I mean, His love is everlasting. It don't ever quit. There was a time, and I'll share here in a minute, when God created the earth and, and, and there was so much sin in the earth, the Scriptures tell us that He was grieved with all the sin that was in the earth. Grieved to the extent that He washed this world clean in Noah's flood. But I'm going to read you some Scriptures here, here in just a minute to, to justify that. I'm also glad, glad that we serve a God that's faithful. And when I mean faithful, I can believe that if I walk over here and plant a seed in that offering plate for, for some people who need help, I got a harvest coming. And I don't put it in there just before I can get something for God. I put it in there because that's who God called me to be. The sower and the seed, there's a big truth there. And, and a while back, I, I was facing a lot of, lot of problems, and I shared with Jim and some of them at Man Up that I was running a little short of money this month. And the Lord told me, when, when you need a bigger harvest, maybe you need to plant more seeds. I mean, uh, and that's right when you didn't want to hear it, but when you need a bigger harvest, maybe you need to plant more seeds so your harvest comes up bigger. And so sometimes I want you to know tonight as I stand before you, man's ways aren't God's ways. And so we don't have an answer. I'm thankful that in spite of all of our sinful nature, here comes Jesus. I'm thankful for Jesus that he came here in the flesh and he walked among us. To set an example to us that we can live a holy life. To set an example for us that it can be done. I'm thankful that he shed his blood for me. He shed his blood for you. I'm thankful that he took stripes over him for our healing. And, and how often is it that we need healing. I prayed for Gary Don and I prayed for him and I prayed for him and I know you prayed for him and we're going to keep on praying for him. And you know one thing I noticed about the book of Job when Job went through all the book of Job and all the things he went through and all the pain and down there around the last chapter Jesus noticed he was praying for three of his friends and that's when God said that's enough. That's enough. And all that he's gone through and all the pain that he's suffered through, he's praying for three of his friends. That's enough. And he re and returned to him two times more, y'all all know the story, than he ever lost. And so sometimes we're put in a position when we're aching and when we're wondering how we're going to make it and when things just fall on all about, all off of us to, to see who we are, to see what we're made of, to see whether we're going to throw in the towel or we're going to give up or we're going to continue to trust God. I'm going to get into a, to something that will back all that up as, as well. And the third thing I'm, I'm going to stand and say that I'm thankful for is when Jesus left this world, he didn't leave me standing here all alone. <laughs> Hallelujah. He sent a comforter. And I don't mind telling you from time to time I need to comfort it. I mean, I need some comfort from time to time. From time to time, I don't got the answer. From time to time, crap falls in on my life and everything goes wrong and everything hits me in the face. And I hear a little voice. 
whispering in my ear, don't pray for me to get rid of all this. Pray for me to make you stronger. Pray for me to make you strong enough to handle this because everybody's watching. Everybody's looking at you and they need to see something that's real. And every now and then, I don't want to be real. But God keeps telling me, I got to be real. I got to keep on fighting it. I got to keep on doing what the scriptures tell me I have the power to do. I got to keep on standing as though I was endued with power from on high because the comforter tells me I am. So I'm going to keep believing that. I'm going to keep believing that the Holy Spirit is never going to leave me or forsake me. I'm going to keep believing that God's not here on earth right now. He used to be when he walked, when he first created the heaven and the earth and, and he walking on the earth and then when Satan got in there and he, he messed things up and got Eve to eat the apple and sin all came about and everything and then, and then back, God backed out of the picture. And then when sin got so bad, he sent Jesus down here and Jesus walked on earth. And then when Jesus left, he went back to the third heaven to sit beside the Father on his throne. And when he left, they sent the Holy Spirit. But what we've got to keep in mind now, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one. So don't that tell me that God's really still here. He's here in spirit. He's here in heart. He moves in our lives. He's still inside of us. Now, another thing I'm thankful for, uh, Lane, have you got that first picture I wanted you to show up there? You know, some of us have been walking with the Lord a long time. I mean, I've given the testimony several times that I got baptized when I was five years old and uh hey uh would you cut them lights off randall for just one minute so they can see this picture because this is a vacation bible study back in 1954 and i want you to notice down there there's two little kids standing there and there at the very bottom and that one on the right over there is a little girl that the lord blessed and made just for me a hundred miles away from me. And she's sitting right over there, my wife. <laughs> and so I want you to see that that little six-year-old, five-year-old girl right there was in vacation Bible school when she was that small and has loved and walked with the Lord all her life. And somehow or another, a hundred miles apart, God managed to get us all over here and meet up in, in horse activities and what all, and we managed to get together. So I'm awfully grateful for a wonderful wife. You know, the Bible tells us that uh, a, a good wife is from the Lord. And I believe that the Lord created her just for me. And after 35 years, uh, I'm just tickled to death that she's going to keep me. You know what I'm saying? That, she, that she's going to keep me. Because I'm pretty sure I'm going to keep her if she'll just, just, she'll just have me. Also, I'm thankful that after teaming up with her, God blessed me with an awesome daughter sitting right over there. Give him a wave there, Kimberly. An awesome daughter who not only loves her mom and dad, but she loves the Lord. And she loves you as her family. And she loves your children. And I've watched her go through great extent for the children in this church and come home with tears in her eyes because she said some of them's hungry and buy them different treats and all and send them home with goodies when they leave so they don't go home hungry. <laughs> and so I'm grateful that God's planted enough wisdom in her to give her a real good job and she's doing great in life. You know, when we lean upon the Lord, God makes a way for us. And when we lean upon our own understanding, all of a sudden it seems like we're nowhere. Have you ever realized that you can't make it on your own without God? Now, I'm also thankful tonight for every one of you. Because whether y'all realize it or not, y'all are my family. Whether you realize it or not, you're going to have to spend eternity with me. You're going to have to spend an eternity a long time. So you might as well get to know me and get to like me now because I'm trying hard to get to know y'all and get to like every one of you because we're going to be together forever. And forever is a long time. It's not just, you know, a thousand years is like a day to the Lord. Now, the title of my message tonight is The Heavenly Spectrum. And I'm glad that God has a plan. I'm glad we're not operating on my plan the heavenly spectrum, I want you to know that heaven is a real place. It's a real place. We think of heaven as somewhere way far off away, but it's a real place. And God the Father is sitting there and Jesus is there and it's considered to be the third heaven. There was a survey ran in the year 2020 by Dr. David Jeremiah 
And he come to the conclusion that there's 240,000 people worldwide that die every day. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people every day that is going to go stand before the judgment seat of the Almighty. Some of them's going to go to heaven. Some of them's not. Broad is the way to destruction and narrow is the gate to righteousness. God wants me to tell you tonight that there's still time for every one of you here. There's still time for me. There's still time for me to become the righteous man in which the Lord created me to be. And all the little piddly things of this world that I can not find in me to be thankful for can be put aside, can be put under. When God created the earth, like I said before, and Adam and Eve walked on the earth, sin came, Satan moved in, and I'm going to share with you and give you scriptures to back up my theory right here. Satan is considered to be the prince of the world right now. He has, he has rights to the earth. And I'm going to give you a whole bunch of scriptures that proves that he don't have rights to the third heaven unless God summons him in there. Now, he can be summoned in there to give an account for himself. But he don't have no right to go prison into God's he heaven up there. He got cast down and he got cast out. Now, I want everybody to know that you have a free will. We serve the kind of God and I ain't so sure that, I mean, I'm just a little pea brain mind. What do I know? I'm a one grain of sand on a seashore. I don't know nothing. But I ain't so sure the whole world wasn't created. And all these people put on it. Just so they see how many goes with Satan and how many goes with God. Just to see whether what you're going to either be a Christian or you're going to play like you want and wind up in the pits of hell. Well, let me tell you right quick. It's not my Father's will in heaven that not even a one would perish to the pits of hell for a lack of knowledge of His goodness. And what we're here to talk about tonight is thankfulness and God's goodness. Now, tonight we're going to kind of tag team y'all a little bit and I'm going to turn this section of it over to my awesome daughter right there where she's going to come up here and say a word or two. Thank you, Kimberly. You need uh, this microphone right here. And let me uh, get it turned on for you. All right. See if you're live. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. No. <laughs> <coughs> did hear that one so um first you guys all want to bow let's pray so lord god thank you for this day lord god through all the trials through everything that we're going through lord god thank you that we're blessed thank you that you're with us lord god thank you that you're guiding us and that you sent a comforter to us to just be with us when we need you when we need guidance when we're stressed whenever we're angry upset joyful that we just have you to turn to lord god and i pray over this message and over everything that's said let it be glorifying to you and let it be all that you want spoken and not what we want spoken in jesus name amen amen so part of what i have is just really it's if you need a title it's a grateful heart just being grateful but also grateful and thanksgiving during suffering you know it's easy for us to be thankful when everything's going right when all of our finances are coming the way we want to whenever our children are behaving the way we want them to when everything's going perfect but are we still thankful when everything's falling apart around us or do we turn and do we get angry and do we get upset and if we are angry and upset do we turn back to god and we ask him for help um, a lot of Christianity, and I've heard over the years, they pray to avoid inconveniences and they pray to avoid sufferings in life and just day to day, like just have it go perfect, have it go smoothly, don't let there be any inconvenience, let's just have it go the way I want it to go. But is that, is that what the Bible really says that we're going to go through, that we're going to have a jolly, happy go happy, go lucky life. We're never going to have a single struggle through everything. So if you guys have your Bible, turn to John 15, 18 through 20. And 
part of this is the hatred of the world. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So what did Jesus go through before he died on the cross? But he was beaten, he was mocked, he was tortured, and he was crucified. And if any of you guys haven't read the science of what his body went through, it, we just say he hung on the cross. But when he hung on the cross, his body suffocated him to death because he slowly grew so weak that his body couldn't support him. And each part failed and it just came to where it basically ended up crushing his heart and his lungs and he suffocated to death. It, the Romans knew what they were doing when they made crucifixion. It was one of the most gruesome deaths around. It wasn't easy. It definitely wasn't fun. He didn't have a joyful time during that. He was in pain. But he looked out. He looked at the world. He saw each of us, and he said, you're worth it. I'll go through that pain because I want you by my side. But so we are told that a servant is not greater than his master. We are also going to be going through persecution. It's not, we might not see it in the way that other parts of the world do. Some parts of the world, Christians are murdered. It's just what they go through. Here, our persecution might look a little bit differently. It might look like, can we go talk to that person in the grocery store about Jesus? Or are we too scared of what other people will think of us? It might look like we're sitting in a body of believers and they're all following a sinful path. Are we gonna speak up and say, hey, we love you guys, but this isn't right. This isn't what Jesus said to us. Our persecution might look different here, but it can still be persecution. But how should we react to persecution? If you guys want to, I'm going to give you what college students call the cliff notes, but it's Acts 5, 17 through 42, and it's about Peter. And just as the background summary, the apostles were thrown in jail. But God sent an angel to break them free out of that prison. Now, question I have is if you had just broken free from prison, what would be your first reaction? Would it be to run away? Well, Peter and them, they went back to the exact same place in the temple where they had been captured in the first place and they started to preach. And they got brought back before the Sanhedrin. And the apostles told them that they would keep teaching about Jesus even after they had commanded them not to. I guess the question I have is would we act that way if we were in that situation? But if you look at Acts 5 and it's verses 40 and 42. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that in Christ is Jesus. Did we do that? Can I? Can you? Can we look at this? and say they rejoiced that they were beaten for the name of Jesus. And if you go to Acts 16, 16 through 40, I'll give you guys the summary again. There was Paul and his partner. They were walking along in a city, and this girl had an annoying spirit. And they were just following him along, just constantly saying things to him. Well, Paul got so annoyed that he just cast the spirit out of her and just said, be gone. Well, the crowd attacked them, tore their garments, beat them many times with rods, threw them in prison, and fastened to stalks. Now, if you think of stalks, it's basically kind of, you know, if you've ever seen, I don't know, I can't remember if it's in, with their feet. I think it's with their feet. 
basically they tied them up with like wood. Kind of if you've ever seen somebody that wood, think feet, and you have what a stalk is. So, but then here's their reaction. While they're in prison, they're praying and singing hymns to God. They're not even upset with everything that they just happened to them. They're just glorifying him. Can we praise him in our suffering? Going on, there's this giant earthquake. Basically, they could have run. They could have been freed. The jailer thinks they escaped, and he almost kills himself. So for background, back in those days, the jailers were held accountable that the prisoners stayed there and paid off their debt to society. If not, it fell back onto the jailer. So the jailer was going to kill himself because he thought all these prisoners had just escaped. Well, then Paul, they did, Paul and Silas, they hadn't left. And through them staying and being obedient and praising God, not only the jailer, but his entire family got saved. And they got baptized. And when you look at the book of Philippians, if you've ever read it, Paul was in prison when he wrote that. He had joy in the midst of his suffering. Do we? Part of it is just the scriptures say about renewing your mind. Renew your mind to have joy in the midst of your suffering. Are you able to face persecution for Jesus' sake? Can you be mocked, beaten, thrown in prison, or killed for him? Can you rejoice through that? If not, how can we get ready? Because I know I've thought about that question, and I, ho I would hope that I could say yes. But you don't know until you're in it. So how can we get ready? So what was the greatest commandment that Jesus had mentioned? Was to love God first. Love him, seek him, seek his kingdom. Have a personal relationship with Jesus. What was next? Love your neighbor Love the people around you, even the ones that are annoying, the ones that cut you off in traffic, love them. In everything, pray. In every situation, pray. When you're hurt, you pray. When you're angry, pray. When you're tired, pray. When you're joyful, pray. When you're anxious, pray. When you don't know what to do, pray. Pray without ceasing. Prayer will strengthen your relationship with God and prepare you for what's coming. The church, just pray and remember the things to be grateful for. Especially be grateful for all Jesus has done for you. He died for you. He loves you. And he wants to know you. Will you let him in? What's holding you back? Give whatever it is that's holding you back over to God. And let him take care of it. Because he can take a whole lot better care of it than you ever could. Thank you, Kimberly. So many ways, she's so so much smarter than me, and I have to turn to her all the time. I can't even order nothing on the phone. You know what I mean? I mean, I can't even get my phone set right. I had to had to take it to her. But now uh, I'm gonna get right back into where I was. I was telling you that there there was a time when God was grieved with the world for so much sin that had taken place on the world. And he decided that he was just going to wash this world clean. And then I find in the scriptures uh, in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 7 through 10, something that's so comforting, something that I'm so thankful for. And, and this has always been one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. And, and, and I care so much about it that when we had the carpet all ripped up and everything, I wrote it on the floor right over there in front of my bench. So every time I sat down on my bench and I get up and I stand up, I'm standing on these scriptures right here. And this scripture says, and this is the Lord speaking, for a brief moment, I abandon you. But with deep compassion, I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you. Only for a moment. But with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you. Says the Lord of hosts, your Redeemer. To me it's like the days of Noah, when I swore that the waters 
of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to ever be angry at you again. Never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love will not be taken from you, nor my covenant of peace be removed from you, says the Lord who has compassion upon you. All your sons and daughters will be taught by the Lord. And great will be your children's peace. In righteousness, you will be established. Oppression will be far from you. And you will have nothing to fear. Terror will be removed from you. And it will not come near you. If anyone attacks you, it will not be coming from me. And whoever attacks you, I'll see to it that they have to surrender unto you. See it. I who created the blacksmith, who fans the coals and flames, I forge a weapon for it to be fit for work. And it is I who, cre who have created the destroyer to work his havoc. No weapon formed against you will prevail. And you will refute every tongue that accuses you. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And this is their vindic vindication from me. So what I would say to each of you, that to me is such an awesome promise from God that he's not ever going to be mad at us again. He's not going to cast us down again. He's going to give us every chance there is on earth to accept him. But we serve a God who has a free will. He's not going to override your desires to, to either go to heaven or go to hell. So I would say to you in Isaiah 55 verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will freely pardon you. For my thoughts, saith the Lord, are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord of hosts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow comes down from heaven and does not return to it again without watering the earth or making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread, so my word goes forth from my mouth, and it will not return to me void. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish whatever I desire for it to accomplish. That's the faithfulness of God. And it will achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. For the mountains and the hills will burst into songs before you. And the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of a thorn bush will grow a pine tree. And instead of briars will grow the myrtle. This will be the Lord's renown for everlasting sign. Which will not be destroyed. So as we sit here tonight. I want you to know that. One of the most awesome things we can be thankful for is God's not giving up on us. I mean, there's not a soul in this building that I could say is perfect. I'm certainly not perfect, and I've made mistakes, but I'm glad that I've got a Holy Spirit to lead and guide me. Lane, you got that second picture I had? Let's see, uh, Randall. Give me lights again. I'm sorry. Now, I want you to kind of look at this picture right here. And, and in the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul describes it. He was caught up in the third heaven. As you see that right there, you see earth. Paul describes a time when he was caught up in the third heaven. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2 through 4. He mentioned himself in the third, in the, as the third person in the presence of the Lord. I know a man in Christ 14 years ago, he says, that was caught up into the third heaven. Whether he was in his body or out of his body, well, I don't know. Only God knows. And I know that this man was caught up 
in a place called paradise and heard expressive things that are not to be repeated or permitted for me to tell. Now the word heavens, it can be used to refer to different realms. Heaven can refer to the sky and the earth and the atmosphere, making it the first heaven. And you can and you can verify that in Deuteronomy 11 verse 11 or in Psalms 104 verse 12 or in Isaiah 55 verse 10 which I just read where the rain falls from heaven and we know rain don't come from outer space. All right, then it can also refer to outer space where the stars and the planets and the second heaven is and you find that in in Psalms 8 verse 3 and Isaiah 13 verse 10. And what we know about the second heaven is very little. I mean, we could play like we know something about it, but you know, when you look at that up there in the second heavens, you got the sun, you got the moon, you got the stars, you got all the other planets, you got all this other stuff going on out there in outer space that you ain't got the clue what's going on out there. How do I know that there ain't another thousand planets out there with people on it just like us standing right here and, and God's in charge of all them too and the devil still has rain over the first and second heaven, but he don't have no rain over the third heaven. How do we know that this whole thing is put together to see how many's going to heaven and how many's going to burn in the pits of hell? You know, there was a they was a time when there was a, a rich man who went went through the gate every single day and he went through the gate and he went through the gate and, and as he was going through the gate he always seen this uh poor man sitting there, a beggar, Lazarus. And he always looked down on him. Never had nothing good to say about him. Then all of a sudden time come when they both died. And the rich man died and Lazarus died. And as the rich man was looking up from the pits of hell, he noticed he saw in the third heaven Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham. And he begged that he would just let that poor man dip his finger in the water and touch my tongue so I could have a drink. So what I'm trying to say is heaven's a real place. And then it refers to God's dwelling place, which we're going to call paradise, which is beyond the other two heavens, a place known as the third heaven. That's mentioned in Psalms 33, 13 through 14, Isaiah 61, Matthew 6 through 9, Hebrews 7, verse 26, and Revelations 19, 11. And when Paul says that he went to the third heaven, what he really means is he went over to the place where God hangs out. He went to a place called paradise. Though we have not seen heaven like Paul has, we know it's a real place. One of the reasons we know it's a real place is because in John 14, verse 1 through 3, Jesus said to his disciples when they was all mumbling and complaining because Jesus told them, look, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be leaving. I'm going on to the third heaven. No, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be leaving. But don't let your hearts be troubled, he said. Because where, where I'm going... Also will you be. In my father's house there's many rooms. And it was, and if it wasn't so, I'd tell you so. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And they all stood there looking saying, uh, If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and I'll take you with me. Where I am, you'll also be. And then Philip says, Well, uh, Lord, how are we, how we going to know the way? You know what Jesus told him? I am the way. I'm the truth, and I'm the life. And as you look upon me, you'll know the way. So when we want to know what the way is, I think we need to look at Jesus. But Jesus done said he's the way. And if, if, if I can't pattern my life after Jesus, then I'm not headed in the right direction. I'm, I'm headed in, a, in a, the way of the flesh. Paul knew that being with Christ was far better than Anything he'd ever experienced on earth. Philippians 1 and verse 21 says, uh, To live with Christ and to die is gain. For me to die is gain if I get to live with Christ. If I'm only gonna if I'm only gonna go on living in the body, this will only mean that I got to continue this fruitful labor. Yet what will I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between two opinions, says Paul. I desire to part with Christ and go on to a better place, which is better by far. But I know it's more necessary for now that I remain here in the body with you. 
and bear truth to the Lord Jesus Christ, bear truth to the gospel. So until God enters, until we enter God's presence, we can state with confidence, just like Paul did. We live by faith and not by sight. And I'm convinced that every one of you sitting here are so valuably important to the Lord. And the reason you're here is because He's not quite through with you. The reason you're here, I mean, some of us are in the construction business, some are in the teaching business, some are in all kinds of different areas of life. And we ain't got to try to set the woods on fire and save the whole world. We've just got to be Jesus wherever we go. Whichever, whatever our environment is, I'm just supposed to be Jesus when I get there. So all the people that's working around me and sees me knows what Jesus looks like. Never mind what I look like. Never mind who I am. They got to see, and if they can't see no Jesus in me, I'm probably doing something wrong. I'm probably not where I'm supposed to be. And so when we think of the earth we're living on, I want you to know that there's a good God. He sure is. But there's also a devil who knows his time's short. And a lot of people don't ever want to talk about the devil because uh, we, want, we want to hide him. Well, he ain't hidden. He's right out in the middle. He's right out in the open. He, he ain't hid from nobody. Satan was originally one of God's angels. And he, and but, but when he rebelled against God, he was cast out of heaven. That's in Luke 10, 18. That was his first stage of punishment. Satan's kingdom was destroyed at the cross. That's in John 12, verse 31 and 32. Later on, he'll be bound for a thousand years. And when he's bound for that thousand years, when Jesus comes back and, and the dead in Christ arise, we'll be walking with him. He will then be, after that, cast into a lake of fire for eternity. That's in Revelation 20, verse 10. So until the final judgment, Satan is considered to be the prince of the world. That's found in John 14, verse 30. But it seems that he still has restricted asset, access to the heavenly realm. That's found in Job 1 and 6. Satan stands in the presence of God. There is a similar situation in 2 Chronicles 18, 18 through 21 involving a lion spirit. Since God is holy and absolutely without sin, Isaiah 6 and verse 3, and since he will not even look upon evil, Habakkuk 1, 13, how can Satan be in heaven? The answer involves God's sovereign restraint of sin. Satan stood before God to give an account for himself. God initiated the meeting, led the proceedings, and remained in absolute control. The result was Satan's power was limited, and God was glorified. Here are some facts that we know. Satan does not have open access to God's presence. He is summoned by God and visits temporarily. His time with God in God's throne, throne room is limited, and in no way is the purity of heaven tainted by the brief visit when God summons him into his presence. As it would be, as, as it were, by God's regulatory power, Satan access is only granted prior to the final judgment. But once the final judgment comes, then uh, he has no more access. But you know, until the return of Jesus, he's real busy right now just jumping through his cell to try to get some of y'all. To try to get, get some of y'all. He wants you. I mean, because he knows his time is short, right? So when we say God cannot allow sin in heaven, we're simply mean that God cannot allow human beings who are still in their sin to live in his presence. But it is possible for God to command a sinful being to come and stand in front of him that that, that person might be judged. And, I, and, and believe me when I tell you, every single person is going to be commissioned in their lifetime to come stand before the judgment seat. And when I get there, I'd like for the Lord to say, uh, you know, the line's pretty long. It's 240,000 died today, but come on, you, you, you go on around. You go on in there. You don't, there ain't nothing. There's, there's no condemnation to those who are, who are living in Christ. So that, that's what I'm hoping to, look, to hear him say. Uh, uh, find my finest faithful servant, Chris, come on in. You, you just come on in, brother. 
And so, so, so you ain't got to stand in the line. So, so right now is the time to make your reservations as to whether you go ahead and stand in that long line or whether you go get to come on down to the front and just come on in. That's my interpretation from the country. So, so okay. Now, God's holiness will eventually consume all sin. Until that day, his holiness regulates sin. And that means that Satan, on certain occasions, is briefly summoned before his presence that he might give an account for his actions. And what I think that means is if, if the hand of the Lord is upon me and his favor is upon me and Satan steps out of his bounds with me, God's going to have something to say to him about it. Now, y'all all know the story of Job. I'm not going to linger on that because I uh, know time's getting away from us. But, but, but have you noticed my faithful servant Job? Yeah, but let me do this to him. He wouldn't be so faithful. Yeah, but let me do that to him. He won't be so faithful. And God let him do that. He let him do this. He let him keep doing things to him. And, and, but you know something? Job remained faithful. And like I told you earlier, all the way down to the end of Job, the book of Job, he was still praying for people when he had done been through hell and high water. And that's what God said he's had enough. And so sometimes... I've shared a couple of testimonies throughout this year. I had a pretty stressful year this year. And uh, so far, I've managed to play like I was happy about it, I guess. I will use the word play like because I've continued to stand with the Lord and I've continued to pray for strength to overcome it, strength to bear it, strength not to, not, not to go to whine and cry and, and, and whine like a little kid and ask God to, to, to remove all these things problems but for for me to be man enough to go through them and i don't know what you're going through but i'm going to tell you something my god is certainly strong enough to give you the strength to go through it my god is certainly strong enough to let you be able to endure whatever he puts before you my god said i'm not going to put nothing before you that you can't do and if i put it before you i just want you to know that you can do it and sometimes I get to telling him, well, I don't know, Lord, you're stretching the rubber band pretty tight there. I mean, uh, I don't know if I can do it or not. So in closing, I just want to ask you a couple questions. Are you thankful? Are you thankful that you're chosen by God? Many are called, yet few are chosen. I feel like I showed you that picture of my wife when she was a little old bitty kid and God prepared her life that she's going to spend the rest of her life with me. At five years old, I was getting baptized and I was in the same scenario. I was going through vacation Bible school all through my life and everything like that. And I always felt like I was chosen by God. I didn't get to go do all the wild and crazy and corrupt things everybody else got to do. I can take you back down to to uh, let's see to the book of Leviticus where it says that if I'm going to be a child of God I'm going to be like a priest of God I can't put no tattoos on me I can't do this and I can't do that and I can't do the other and I can't do this and I'm not criticizing nobody on earth none of you I'm telling you what I can't do I'm telling you who I am I'm not telling you who you got to be or what you got to be or how you got to act nothing nothing to do with you but I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit when you're chosen there's certain things that God wants you to do to let the world know that you were chosen you're not just uh, you're just, I mean you was chosen and so I ask you tonight are you chosen of the Lord are you indwelt with the Holy Spirit because if you do if you are I'm going to notice it because if you are I'm going to be convinced that man is endued with power from on high. Because every time I see him, he's in a fast race and pace. And everything he, he touches blossoms. And every seed he plants grows. And there's a harvest going. And he's got all kind of things going on in life. Because he's endued with power on, on high. And he's not doing it in his own fleshly way. He's not doing it in his own self. There have been so many times when people have tell me they thought I was the kind of man who's Step in a pile of cow poop, come out smelling like a rose. And it never was that. It was God always would bless what I put my hands to. And even though sometimes when I put my hands to something and I stumble and fail, God is still there to make it good. He's still there to, to, to help me overcome it. So I'm just asking you, are you endued with power from on high? Because if you are, I sure ain't worried about you because you're going places. You're going to be a provider. 
all your needs are going to be met because you're connected to the Holy Spirit. And every time somebody tells you you can't, you're just going to laugh at them. Say, what do you mean I can't? I don't even know what that word means. I can do. I can do do it. And so I want, I want to hope that you're seeking to the, be endued with the power. Do you have an intimate relationship with God? I mean, do you just pray when you're in trouble? Or each day when you're out there, do you literally just talk to God like me and my wife laugh at each other sometimes because I'll come in there in the kitchen and I'll say, who are you talking to? She just look at me and she'd be talking to the Lord. And she'd come out there in the yard and I'd be out there just to talk, just talk, just talking up to him. Who are you talking to? Like we're getting kind of senile or something, but, but you know, but uh, <laughs> we're talking to the Lord. I mean, hallelujah. And he's listening. And that's what I like about it is he's listening. Do you have God's peace? Knowing that even though the devil's running all over where we're trying to do what he can do, I got peace in my heart that I'm chosen. God called me to be a part of his kingdom and I'm going to be part of it. And, and the devil can, he can pester me, but he can't have me. He can't have me. And he can pester you, but he can't have you. And uh, he, he can come blow smoke in your ear, Jim, and he wants you to go off over here and do this and do that and do the wrong and do that. And all you got to do is say, no, get thee behind me, Satan, just like Jesus said, and then I ain't doing it. And, and, and that's all you got to do. Get thee behind me, Satan. What's the matter with you? Who do you think I am? Do you have unconditional love for God? Does that mean do you love God only when he done something good for you, or do you love him all the time? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we can love him all the time. Do you have a moment to moment presence with God? In other words, do you take one moment out of your whole 24 hour day, he give you a new day? Or are you thankful enough to just take one minute out of that day and stop and pray and talk, thank God? I don't believe a, a day should go by in a person's lifetime that they ain't got 15 seconds to stop and thank God for giving them that day. And, 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 and people like me and people like Jim and people like us who are kind of seasoned, we, we appreciate every day. Is that right, Jim? If I could get up and go another day uh, full steam ahead, hallelujah be it, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful. And I got to start off my day every morning when my foot hits the ground. I woke up this morning at a quarter till six. And I was going. And my wife was downstairs cooking bacon. And I could smell that bacon. That's what woke me up. Because it was my birthday. She didn't have any breakfast before I got up and got to leave it. But, but uh, she done it down there cooking bre- bacon in, in early in the morning. Do you have a promise wrapped around your life of God's protection? Or do you even know what that means? Will you have a bodily resurrection? Are you convinced of that? Do you have an eternal home in heaven? Well, I think I'm going to heaven. Don't be thinking. It's got to be burning in your heart that you know you're going. Do you have access to the Word of God? All answers is right here. Do we ever get it? Do we ever look for the answers? If I was going to take a long trip tomorrow and go over to the other side of the world and didn't know where I was going, how to get there, wouldn't I need a road map to tell me how to get there? I mean, the best thing ever come out with is that little gal on that thing that says, turn that next red light and turn. And you know what I mean? Because if we're driving in Dallas, I got my wife. What's she say? What's she say? And so, but we used to have to get the old map out and look, you know what I'm saying? But uh, now we can just listen. I, I can listen better than I can read and drive, especially through the Dallas traffic. So, <laughs> as God's child, let me just ask you, as a child of God, does this describe you? This is my question for you tonight that you can carry off and ask yourself throughout the week. Do you actually have a grateful heart? Because if you have a grateful heart, then the Lord is glorified in you. Regardless of all the crud that's hit me in the face this year, which has been quite a bit. I mean, the drought, the hay, the the storms, the trees, the, just a whole bunch of stuff. The air conditioners all went out all the same time, big storm hit, and, and all the stuff that hit me, I've still got a grateful heart. That even though the devil's pestering me, I've still got a God that loves me, and he's going to make things right. And I'm overcome, I've overcome every bit of it. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an overcomer. I'm going to stand on that ground. 
Are you aware in your life of God's presence? Because if you're not aware of God's presence, I pity you. I pity you if you just kind of wish God would come find you and, and hunt you. You need, you need to seek out the Lord. Seek and you will find. Do you have a humble spirit? One thing I learned about serving the Lord, I can either, either you know, kind of being an old redneck and all, it's kind of hard to be humble. You know what I mean? It's hard to be humble sometimes. But let me tell you what I know about God. If I don't humble myself, he'll snatch the rug right after under my feet and he will flat humble me. I've seen him humble me many a time. And it's easier for me just to go ahead on and humble myself so I don't have to get humbled. I mean, it's kind of like if I just do right, then I don't have to get a spanking. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so many years later, I've about decided I just, just about soon do right. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like when you, when you do something, like write a check or something, and you don't keep the receipt, and, and you got to go home, and the wife gets all, what did you say? Well, it's easier just to do right than it is to argue with her. You know what I'm saying? I mean, <laughs> I've, I've pretty much learned that too. So uh, do you have a heart that has the Lord's peace in it? Because without God's peace, in a corrupt world that we're living in, it's hard to live. But I have peace in my heart that regardless of what's going to take place tomorrow, I got peace that it's going to be all right. Do you, are, you, are you thoughtful of others? Do you care about anybody's life besides your own? I mean, uh, to me, to not having man up breakfast this, this, this next Saturday and getting to take all these clothes over and give them to somebody... It's kind of special to me. I mean, the reason it's special to me is because some of them people that we seen at Thanksgiving was sitting there shivering and they was cold and they didn't even have a coat and they didn't have this and they didn't have that and they was tickled to death to wrap up in anything. And that's when it kind of hit me that, you know, uh, rather than sitting over there eating biscuits and gravy and worrying about your own self, looks like you might want to spend one Saturday to come over and worry about these people. Are you thankful about anybody else besides yourself? Because the Lord says that when... When you look upon the poor with compassion, he has compassion on you. So let's see. Are you unselfish or are you selfish? I mean, sometimes when uh, the Lord blesses us, it might not be the whole blessing just for me. It might be that something that fell out of the sky might be so I could help someone else. Do, do you expect gratitude or do you express gratitude when somebody does something for you have you got just one minute to stop and tell them thank you i mean do you, have you got just a minute to let them know that you appreciate them sometimes uh it makes a lot of difference in a personal life if he just knows he's appreciated are you a friendly person or are you one that's always wearing that smile upside down you know what I'm saying? Where it ain't, you always frown. Have you ever seen these people who are just, just miserable about everything? And after you've hung around them a little while, well, you're almost miserable. Well, you need to try to get that misery out of them. Tell them, look, man, you got it all wrong. You got it all wrong. You need to turn that, that smile up. You got it upside down. So do you have a contagious personality that just gets on other people that, that's completely likable? Because I believe that's what Jesus would like for us to have. Are you motivated to pursue the Spirit of the Lord? Do you have a high level of faith? Are you fruitful for the kingdom of God? You know our purpose here is to bear fruit for the Lord. We sometimes think our purpose here is all about us. And what I'm slowly learning in my latter years is ain't none of it about me. I mean... I mean, the uh, book of Ecclesiastics says it. it's all meaningless. It's all worthless. I mean, we're just out here working ourselves and everything, and it's, and it's meaningless. Without love, we're nowhere. So uh, that's about all I have for tonight. And I just want to thank each one of you for being here and for being faithful on Wednesday night and for, con for considering yourself as a part of the bride of Christ. I know that the Lord loves every one of you, and, and don't, don't grow weary. Just like Jesus said, don't let your heart be troubled of what all Satan's trying to do, because we serve a, serve a powerful God. And I'm going to continue to see great things happen in each one of your life. I know that each one of your, I like to see the desires of your heart come true. I've seen them come true in my own life, and, and, and in midst of all the pain that I've went through this year, by the end of the year, 
I'll be doing just fine. And the uh, Lord's going to take care of me. I'm not convinced for a second that he's not my provider and that our needs will not be met. Let me pray right now. You got something to say? Oh, okay. Thanks for sharing my birthday with you. Okay. Well, uh, usually you share your birthday with your family, right? <laughs> so I'm going to consider y'all my family. I don't know where else I could go and, and find a better crowd that I'd rather stand with than the ones I love right here, the ones I love in Jesus' name, the one that I consider to be my family. You know, when they told Jesus that, hey, your, your family's outside, what did he say? He said, hey, my family is them who do the will of the Father. That's who my family is. And I know that if, if y'all are here on Wednesday night, it's because you love the Lord. It's because you want to be a part of this bride, bride of Christ. It's because you are part of the family. And, I, and I'm going to continue to confess that you're my family. Lord Jesus, we just thank you tonight. We just thank you, Lord, for your love. I just thank you, Lord, that you haven't given up on us. I just thank you, Lord, for the peace that you put in our hearts and, and all that happens to us, Lord. I'm just thankful that you're standing right there. I'm just thankful that the devil can pester us, Lord, but he can't have us. I just thank you, Lord, that each one of these members that are here tonight, I'm going to get to spend eternity with them in heaven. I just pray, Lord, that you continue to strengthen, strengthen them and give them the courage and the ability to overcome whatever is thrown in their face. I know, Lord, there's some here that has financial needs. There's some here that have health problems. There's some here that have spiritual needs. I'm just praying right now in the mighty name of Jesus that the Holy Ghost would send the nourishment in which they need, that these needs might be met. That the wealth, that, would, that it would flow freely, Lord. I just pray, Lord, for wisdom. Like I said earlier, if one is in financial problems, maybe they need to plant a few more seeds that they might have a bigger harvest. And that don't always mean putting money in a bucket. That might just mean stopping and being kind to someone else. That might just mean embracing somebody else who's hurting worse than they are. I just pray, Lord, that your compassion be upon us and that you continue to lead us and guide us and direct us and don't let us go the wayward way of the world. Don't let us operate in the flesh, Lord, because that road don't never seem to lead nowhere. I just thank you for our church and what you're doing here, Lord. And I just thank you that we serve an awesome, awesome God like you. Lord, if anyone has any health issues or any prayer requests or anything like that, let them feel free to come to these altars right here because I know that you'll meet them there at the altars. And we just thank you and praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen.